Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dark Rhino Security, Security Confidential. Today, we have another very great guest with us. Uh, we're honored to have Greg Schaefer join us. Greg is the founder of Virtual Sizzle Services. He started the company in 2017 to help small, medium businesses. He has over 33 years of experience in IT and security. I guess 15 years of that 33 is actually at the CISO level. So that's a lot of time spent in cybersecurity. He's the host of the Virtual CISO Moment podcast. Take a listen to it. And has authored the book, Information Security for Small and Mid-Sized Businesses. It's great to have you on the show, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to actually be like receiving the questions for once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love uh, having uh, other podcast hosts on because it saves me the trouble of talking. And I'm sure people want to hear your advice. Well, um, I hope you're, so. <laughs> you know, well, the topic is square in uh, the wheelhouse of the audience. So, uh, you know, we primarily have small and medium businesses that mm -hmm. listen in. And uh, we tr try and get folks that can speak about uh, the trials and tribulations they have in their context. And cybersecurity is a big topic for those folks. And, and we'll get into that. But before we do, how did you get into cyber in the first place? Well, it was kind of by accident because I really didn't want to work at Burger King. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I was a student at the, at the University of Buffalo, and, and this was a few years ago in 1989. It, it was really okay. before Al Gore had just invented the Internet. So it was just oh, right bit, then, right around then. Um, and our local computing center uh, had a job offering for a network technician, student assistant part time. And I figured, well, that'd be better than flipping burgers. I'd probably learn something, although my computer knowledge was limited just to programming in Fortran 77. I was a, an engineering student at the time. And Can so I, I went ask to what the type of engineering? Uh, I was mechanical. Well, I was aerospace at first. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, the Cold War ended and, and uh, aerospace oh engineering God. market dried up and I went to mechanical. And but uh, so you were a smart. I got to just hold you there for a second uh, and get sidetracked because uh, we have a similar story, except I finished aerospace and the and during the Cold War ending, I was one of the few people that found a job in that gig. Congratulations. Well, if I had found a job, I, I wouldn't be here. So, And then, of course, it didn't work out. So now I'm a podcast host. And there you go. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> well, and also, and, and I know we're, 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 we're off track. I'll get back to the original answer. But but the uh, I mean, so much about people getting into cyber right now, the, 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 the whole discussion about, well, what do we need to do? What certifications, what degrees and all this and all that? How did you do it, Greg? We didn't have all that back then. That's right. So so, so I was also in the Air Force Reserve at that point in time, okay. and the, and the 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 individual at the University of Buffalo um, who was interviewing me, he was a drill, he, he was a former drill sergeant, Marine Corps, hardcore Paris wow. Island, okay, and a little bit in, intimidating maybe interviewing with him, but uh, he he hired me and he said simply put, if you can follow a TO to fix airplanes, a TO <laughs> is technical orders, it's basically a binder, then you can figure out how to do this computer networking stuff. <laughs> and uh, and here I am, thirty three years later. So. That's fantastic! What a great story. Uh, and so, did you? Were you doing? Uh, you were then doing cyber in the Air Force? No, 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 no. I was a mechanic on C one thirty aircraft and uh, oh, wow. um, spent six months in Desert Storm. And uh, but there was but but there's a lot of um, transferability, if that's a correct word. Um, oh sure. The uh, the the what you need to do as far as troubleshooting on an aircraft mechanic wise, and what you need to do in networking, and then infosec cyber and all of that. Oh yeah, I I mean, if you can uh, go through that manual and understand it, I think you can go through most manuals that are prevalent in the products and technologies. Absolutely, not, absolutely. Not that that's interesting to do that all the time, but hey, <laughs> someone's got to do it. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> no, so let you know getting into the what brought you to SMB then? Because you know, looking at a little bit of your bio, bio, it seems like you have a little bit of a passion for that segment of the space. Why, why SMB and not the enterprise? Or what are you? What are your thoughts? Well, on? well, um, th th this was a little bit of a calling. Uh, I had been in larger organizations for the majority of my career. Started out in higher ed, then got into government. I was the first 
CISO for Nashville Davidson County after they had a major breach. So they, okay. they created the position for that just to make sure everybody understands that I wasn't there when the breach happened. Uh, and then from there, uh, worked as CISO for, for a bank and, and eventually then got this little tap on the shoulder. It was a God moment for me that uh, maybe you could do better with your talents. And I'm like, well, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Never had that sort of a push for it. But um, the whole idea being that I kept on hearing about small and mid-sized businesses, SMBs, that that they don't have the the access to the um, experience that, well, you know, 15 years or at that time, 10 years being at the CISO level um, really can help with the business. So I decided I would make the jump. The virtual CISO field was just kind of a little bit starting at the time. It had been around yeah. for a couple of years and I figured I'd just jump in and I'd try it. And um, best thing I ever did. So it's all about helping small and mid-sized businesses at this point in time. Um, same thing with the, uh, just like what you do with your podcast, same thing we do for the virtual CISO moment is that's all about two things, helping SMBs and helping um, uh, people who actually provide that support for SMBs. Oh, that's fantastic. So this is a, this is a calling for you and that's uh... absolutely, absolutely. Hey, you know, if God asks you to do something, the best answer is usually yes. So <laughs> eh, tough, tough uh, guy to argue with. <laughs> <laughs> usually doesn't work out in the way you think you should. <laughs> so, right. so if you go, um, I, one of the podcasts I listened to was your origins episode. I, mm -hmm. I love listening to the origins because it, it always gives the why and the why to me. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, there's a quote out there is that the man who knows how will always have a job, but the man who knows why will always be his boss. No, I like that. No, I, right. it's not familiar. I, I might have heard it, but you know, I'm old. I could have forgotten it. Yeah. Well, welcome <laughs> so. to that club, right? Uh, well, <laughs> it, 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 it dates me a little bit, but I always remember that. And, and the why to me is always more important than the how. Not that the how is not important, mm -hmm. but there's often, if you don't know the why, you're going to miss a lot of things that you should be doing in the how. And right. which which gets into, you know, you mentioned in that origins podcast, and I'm really just paraphrasing here that there's a gap in SMB between technical controls and integrating security with the business. And I think you gave an example of uh, not a small business, the Equifax breach on how they got breached, but the why you said was more important. So enlighten us a little bit up behind that statement and what your thoughts are there. Well, to put it in a little bit of context, that was in November of uh, 2017. And so Equifax was fresh on everybody's mind. It yep, was, I, I, I could have chosen the, 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 um, the breach du jour <laughs> and it would have been <laughs> fine. Um, but Equifax was the one. The best way that I can describe this is working with what is referred to as the three lines of defense and, and model. And, and just basically speaking, this is sort of my elevator speech. I try to keep it to within 10 floors. Uh, the first line of defense is like technical management. So in, in information security, that would be really the cybersecurity side, the technical side of, of firewall management, log reviews, that sort of thing. Right. The second line is risk management and risk assessments, risk mitigation. That's where the CISO usually falls in an organization. And then the third line is audit. And so the gap there is people organizations still to this day really look at information security as purely technical. Now, I like to distinguish information security and cybersecurity as cybersecurity okay. being a subset of InfoSec. InfoSec is the holistic risk management. You got people process technology, yep. business continuity, disaster recovery, whereas cyber is more of the technical side. And so small and mid-sized businesses, they're thinking, oh, well, if I have a firewall in place, I should be fine and, and all of that. Yeah. And they don't think about the second line, the risk management, the strategic planning, the integration with the business processes and goals, because, you know, cybersecurity is a, is a cost center. It's a, it's a capital magnet. I mean, it just draws money away. You're not going to make money directly with a great cybersecurity program, but you're going to avoid loss. And that's what has to be conveyed. So when I talk about gaps there for small and mid-sized businesses, and it's still extraordinarily prevalent today, 
um, that's that's what they're missing. They're missing the idea that get away from the idea that protecting data is all about technology and move it to it being a business process. Absolutely. And, you know, it reminds me, uh, I'm sure you're highly familiar with defense in depth, right? So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Layered security, you, defense in depth. depth. Yeah. So defense in depth is fundamentally a strategy, which came out of the military, right? Mm -hmm. And it encompasses all three of those layers. But when you look at the SMB space, and a lot of times we encounter it every day, it's SMBs more often than not think of it as technical controls and Correct. the people, the processes behind those are very important. Mm -hmm. The, what you are protecting is highly important. I, I'll give you an example. And this is not an SMB. It was a, it was a very large studio and, mm -hmm. and you've seen multiples of their movies. I can guarantee you, I can't mention their name, but the, I think you I have absolutely <laughs> seen uh, their productions. In fact, mm -hmm. everybody in the world has seen their productions and the interesting, and they had, they don't have one CISO. They have multiple CISOs, mm -hmm. multiple CIOs for different groups. And in their case, when a movie goes to final cut they they were putting those files on an unprotected server. And uh -huh. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a classic example of someone not understanding defense in depth. And it was mind boggling to me that that would happen in a place of that caliber because layer upon layers of controls, security audits, compliances with every standard that's ever been known. Yet in the end, it became a process thing where mm -hmm. the guys who are working the cutting room floor there, there's not a cutting room floor anymore. It's actually a whole bunch of computers that right. work, right? Uh, it's not days of yesteryear, but they're just putting those out on some server. And right, right. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> well, sometimes the bigger the organization, the more the gaps and processes come about because there's, there's, I think that there can be a, a real problem as far as communication. You get silos building up with the or organization and particularly when you have mergers and acquisitions as well too, because boy, it's great to close that oh, deal, yeah. but the actual integration can take a long time and there are a lot of gaps there. Oh, huge number. And sometimes those gaps are never closed. And a lot of times divestitures happen before you even get around to working those gaps. So correct. That's a whole nother, whole nother topic, but do you see in SMB, what about the executive or the owners of the business that go in and say, you know what, we're compliant. We meet all the compliance check marks that we need to. Why do well, we need to go further? Why, yeah, and, and that gets back to, you can summarize it in the, in the often used and maybe abused sometimes, uh, compliance is not an in information security statement. We all say it. It's sort of like, I think that in order to be a CISO, you, that's like CISO 101, you got to pass that, cat, that, that class and yeah. be able to make, say these things. But, but what it really comes down to is that are you really being serious about information security? So with, with my firm, BCISO Services, we purposefully will not work with an SMB if their only goal is compliance. When, when we have our introductory call, we kind of try to flesh that out. Well, why, why are you wanting to do this? And if there's not that buy-in, then we just politely say, no, there are other um, providers out there. There are other different types of virtual CISOs out there, but we're just all about building a quality security program for you. And in order to do that, you can't bring in somebody and just take something off a bookshelf and say, hey, you've got a great security program. You have to live it. You have to breathe it. You have to believe in it. You have to support yeah. it. And you have to constantly be improving it. And you've got to understand that it's part of the business. So uh, sometimes it's okay sometimes for compliance to be a gateway to that revelation because a lot of times you see more in SMBs now, um, particularly as far as like third-party supply chain management. Yeah. Uh, in the private sector, you need to have a SOC 2. In the government sector, well, it's CMMC version 2. Sure. It's right there. And you have to prove that you're compliant with this these frameworks. Yes. But that's just the beginning of it right there. Bottom line is, 
if you don't have executive management buying in and understanding that this is actually a business enabler and not just a cost center, you're not going to be able to build an effective security program. I, I love it. I, and I guess that gets down to it is a business enabler. And is that why SMB really needs to care about it? You know, SMBs, depending upon the size and the market they're in, they've got a lot of things that are going on, especially if they're like in the startup phase. And usually security is one of those things that is not like in the first like 25 or 30 things on their mind as far as just making sure, okay, I don't want our data to get out. I don't want to have a breach. That's cool. I understand that. But as far as the building the program and understanding the depth of the program and all of the policies, procedures, the training, the the cultural shift that needs to go into that, that gets to be a little bit more of a weighty thing. And the larger businesses have kind of gone along with that and learned because some of them, particularly in finance and healthcare, well, there's a lot of regulations there. Right. And then some of them, well, they've been bitten or they've seen others that have been bitten and they don't want to be the next one to be bitten. So it's, but it's SMB still think that, well, you know, I'm so small, it's okay. I can fly under the radar. And that's unfortunately the worst thing to think about because that's not the case. And the bad guys are going after those people that are thinking that they're flying under the radar. And I, you said exactly what I was hoping you would say. On this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, what was my payment for that? You know, I, well, I, I'll, you know what? <laughs> cup of coffee. Yeah, we'll cup of coffee, <laughs> maybe a beer, something. I don't know what. Um, the, name your poison, Be, <laughs> because I I think it's uh, it's really really important what you just said. Hmm. Um, businesses sometimes just. They don't understand. They need to understand their fit also in the supply chain with their customers. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And if they don't understand it, their customers will tell them. Will tell them. And they may be a great conduit into a much larger organization. And that organization may represent a significant amount of revenue to an SMB. Remember the breach at Target? That was an HVAC contractor. Right, they got in through the uh, the POS terminals, the, That's the right. memory sca scraping. Yeah, and 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 that was purely, uh, well, there was a cascading failure of controls there. Oh, Defense there was a whole bunch depth, of things the, that happened. I, I mean, I mean, but but the root cause was, uh, as you said, it was third party supply chain, right there. It's a, it's supply chain. It's it's third party. So when we think about business enablement, yes, a lot of times cyber is put in as a cost center, but perhaps if you understand where you fit in your in the supply chain for your revenue sources, you may look at it a little differently. The winners are going to be the ones that look at it differently. Yeah, yeah. that's another very good way to put it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you want to win, right? You, I you mean, that's why you're in business. You know, you, you, you have to take risks in business, including InfoSec risks, but that's risk of opportunity. You got to understand the opportunity. You got to understand how to protect it. And those who understand how to protect it and, and to flourish in that opportunity, they're going to be the ones that are going to survive and thrive as opposed to, you know, my, my business is, is we're going to hit the five year mark. Um, let's see in two weeks um, from when I incorporated this. It made, Congratulations. Did the LLC. And they say, with, well, thank you. And then they say with small and mid-sized businesses, you get to five years, it's like, okay, you've, you've actually got there. A lot of businesses, the majority of business, I, I don't know the stats, but I understand the majority of businesses, they start out, they fail within five years. And it's not just InfoSec. It's that they, they, they focus so much on, on what they're trying to do, but they don't realize that there's all these other things that they need to encompass in order to be successful. And InfoSec, cybersecurity as a subset, is a huge part of that as well, too. So it's nothing different than than being good with accounting. I mean, you want to make sure that that you know you, your accounts receivable. If you if that's a really bad process in your business, you're you not going to survive because you're going to leave money on the table. So I got to This takes us to two uh, two other questions here. Okay. And we, I've run into these, and and I'm curious to get your answer on it. Is, hey, look, you know what? We're gonna just go with minimal controls, and we're gonna farm out our risk to the cyber insurance gods. Call it a day. <laughs> I, I'm not. Right. I'm not making this up. I'm serious. I am not right. making this up. I. I. 
I don't have enough fingers to count how many times I've <laughs> personally gotten that uh, kind of a comment back. We got semantic. We got some antivirus. We got a firewall. Um, and we got cyber insurance. We're done. Well, Go. good luck with that, first of all, because the cyber insurance industry is mm, – they're they're staying steps ahead here, and they're not going to underwrite unless they're really sure about the controls you have in place. Now, it used to be that they would go out and they would send you a questionnaire, and you could just check off the boxes and so forth. And that's right. Now, uh, some cyber insurance agencies are being more proactive before that their cyber policy is being up for review and renewal they're actually reaching out two to three months beforehand and, and helping the SMB go through a review. They'll actually have cyber experts that'll help them review their program. Well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And if there are gaps there, then, then you, can, you can close the gaps. You, the, the idea of that, you know, transferring risk is one way to deal with risk. You know, you can accept, you can mitigate, you can transfer um, you can, you can remove the risk. I'm missing the term, um, that the, the real term for that. And then I always say that there's like a fifth, you can ignore it, but that's really not a risk management, uh, risk treatment. But if you leave it to progress, <laughs> right. hope is not a strategy. Okay. Hope is not a strategy. Um, <laughs> but, but, but if you transfer the risk, you still own the risk. You're not really transferring the risk. You're just transferring the mitigation. And, um, that's, that's not a good strategy. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that cyber insurance isn't a good strategy. It's certainly part of a multi-layered strategy you have to have in place. We have cyber insurance in place for that very purpose. But it should be sort of like, you know, that 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 drip basin under the old refrigerators. You know, in case you have like a little bit of a leak, you know, you're not going to ruin your floor. So if there's something left, at the very least, um, but that's before all the other controls and they may have failed. Those that are going out there and saying, well, I, I'm doing the minimum, I'm checking the boxes on firewall and antivirus and all that, and cyber insurance will pick up the rest, they're not going to be in the winner's circle. It's just not a good strategy. I I love it. You said it, not me. So people listening, <laughs> you got it from the expert. So there you I mean, go. I mean, I mean, look at, look at what you need, though, as far as from a, um, as far as from a, a cost exposure perspective. Uh, um, uh, perspective. And, and if you really want to get into this, you can talk about doing like a quantitative risk assessment using fair factor. Analysis That's of information expensive. Risk. That's the, pro we are, we've been fair practitioners and that engagement can be very expensive for us. It can be, it can be very expensive, but you can also distill it down and make it a little bit simpler. Um, I'm a, I'm open fair certified as well. So I, I totally get it. it it's like, you know, Sometimes people say it's like they want to do a quantitative risk on every element within their program, and I'm, there's not enough hours in the year. That's right. Um, but if you have an idea of your cost exposure, that will help to inform what your cyber insurance uh, coverage should be. I'm Which, sorry. I just went on a tangent. No, there, you I did not. I am fair. A, no, fair. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm very, very familiar with it. Uh, they are actually in our backyard. We're in Dublin, Ohio, and they're a Columbus organization. We know. Oh, okay. okay. We've, uh, you know, we have people on our team that are certified in that. And it's, we just, a lot of times it can be an expensive exercise and which gets to the, the thing, you know, why not just, you know, if we get ransomed, well, let me back up. What is, what have you seen from your experience as some of the ways in which small medium businesses get breached what what are their top threats or tackles? oh I, I think I, I think it's it's the the, the the top one has to be uh, clicking on something it, it, it's just you, you that's such an easy vector in and there's such a it's almost a passionate religious argument on LinkedIn and other places is like well, some are saying in, in cybersecurity awareness, got to do better, better, better. Others are saying, stop blaming the user and put in technical controls and, and, and all of that. And it's really a combination of both. The bottom line, though, is that we're always going to have controls that can't catch everything. And we're always going to have people that are going to click because people are people. They're human. That's exactly right. And, and, and you can't mitigate that. And so um, past a certain point. And so you have to have the processes in place behind it and, and assume it's like, okay, so, so 
what what happens if if we get hit with ransomware? Um, last year, uh, for our clients, we did as a tabletop uh, ransomware exercise. Some of them weren't too uh, excited about it because um, I, they they remember that in 2018, the topic that we did for our clients was uh, was pandemic, and okay. everybody's like, "Well, we're never going to have to deal with a pandemic. Why are we doing this?" And <laughs> well, so 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 COVID <laughs> became my fault because we did the pandemic. pandemic. So they were Isn't afraid that. that <laughs> you know, if, if we do the ransomware exercise, Greg, does that mean we're going to get hit by ransomware now? Well, because you kind of like have this skill, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's seriously, um, in a lot of cases, they hadn't thought through the, what, what are we going to do if, if, if we have that hit and you don't want to make those decisions in the heat of the moment, you want to be sure that you've coordinated with, with, it's not a technical thing at that point in time. It's a business thing. It's a legal thing. It's a marketing thing. It's a, it's a reputational thing. Cause you got to talk about it. You may or may not get your, get your information back. And at this point in time, ransomware, it's not even, they've pivoted now to like, they don't even care about encrypting as much anymore. They just take your data and, 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 uh, ex, you know, through extortion, they say, well, you pay us and we won't release it. But if you don't have the, the, the playbook in place or whatever you want to call it. A lot right. of people like to use the term playbook. I don't know. That seems like it seems know, like the common everyone likes. You got it. What's your yeah, playbook? But, but I always think like X's and O's and running around the quarterback and all that, I guess. But 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 you do have to have something in place where where you're 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 able to follow that in the heat of the moment. So I, I call them triggers. What are the triggers for starting your um, incident security, information security, incident response team? What are the triggers to start thinking about ransomware? What, what, what does your cyber insurance say? Because a lot of cyber insurance policies, you have to work through them because you're, they're probably going to be paying the ransom, depending upon how your policy is, is built out. And I guess that gets to the question. You know, you look at some of ransomware is now a service and some of them even have 800 numbers that you can call and, and if you get hit a second time, they'll give you a ten percent discount. How nice of them! <laughs> but what? What the? <laughs> you, you call it, it's like I, I can call the ransomware help desk. Hi, uh, my ransomware isn't working. Well, okay, <laughs> can we have like remote access to your computer, please? <laughs> anyway, go ahead. But but that it kind of speaks to the, the there's a mentality out there that it's just cheaper to pay the ransom than it is to instantiate a comprehensive cybersecurity program, or I should say an information security program. Well, well, uh, I, I guess maybe I'm going to get a little bit soapboxes box. Please do here. Okay. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm kind of vertically challenged anyway. So if I can stand on something, it, 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 it helps, but uh, you know, I can't say short. I'm trying to be politically correct here. Um, but uh, uh, I, I don't think that I, I fundamentally don't like paying the ransom because you are perpetuating the cycle. You are, you are creating a demand for a service and, you know, typical, I mean, these are businesses, as you said, ransomware is a service. It's like, uh, all of these criminal organizations, they run it like a business. They have HR departments. They probably have help desks actually. Probably. Um, and, and, and if you keep the demand up, then the supply will continue to meet that demand. Now, having said that, this is not black and white because when it comes down to if the choice is paying the ransom or your business goes belly up, I mean, you have no choice. You have, yeah. Um, at that point in time, it's, it's the, the best way to answer that question is to never have to answer that question. And it, this is at the time when I say, call me Captain Obvious. I understand that. That's an obvious thing to say. But, but, it it becomes the lesser of two evils. I always recommend don't pay the ransom unless you absolutely have to. But but if they ask me, Greg, should I pay the ransom? Ultimately, I say, I cannot tell you to pay it or not. I can advise you on the risks. That's what a CISO does. But the C-suite and the board, they are the ones that have to make the decision. Because whether you're a CISO or, you're, or a virtual CISO, our primary job is to provide risk-based information to those folks so that they can make risk-informed decisions. Absolutely. And I, I'm glad you, you, you said that. Uh, Let me jump off my soapbox now. No, okay. no. You know, the <laughs> FBI says the, the same, they, they're big uh, proponents of not paying the ransom, but the reality is that your business is out. If you don't, you got to do it. 
and uh, you, you most likely do. I mean, I, I mean, you're in business to stay in business. So, um, you know, learn from it, and move on. Yeah, and and the best thing, as you said, Captain Obvious here is. Don't get into a situation where you need to have that conversation. Uh, now, now I hope I hope we don't get into trouble with Hotels.com because I use their uh, their their trade. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We you know we haven't gotten some hate mail in a long time. Maybe we'll get somebody out. Some troll will say something. I'll. It's free advertising. That's the way I would answer it. Okay, so we mentioned you. We anyway. mentioned you. Have fun. You know, enjoy it. So you know that brings us to a, a, a question that. I I have gotten asked in live seminars that I've done quite a bit that if you're a small medium business, how how do I cut through the noise? Because I don't have the resources in house typically. Even if you're a six hundred or a thousand employee company, a lot of times you might only have fifty front end office workers. It may not be depending on the type of business. You may not have a CTO, a CISO, a CIO. You may have a director of IT that's handling your internal networks and your computers and, and manages the help desk. Great people. But how do I roadmap a program? Like how, how, what, how does this journey begin? And, and that's a tough, you know, they find it very difficult. They're like, we, we get sold on technology a lot. And that's true. There's a lot of technology salespeople out there. Well, I, I don't I don't think that you could have lobbed the question, the softball question any better for me, because the answer that I'm obviously going to say is like, well, look into the virtual CISO servers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but seriously, uh, like like um, that's not uh, a bad, you uh, know, actually outsourcing this portion and realizing that you don't have the assets is not. When I say the assets is the human resources to do this is not a bad realization. Right. Uh, uh, last last week or yeah, I think it was this past week on on the virtual CISO moment podcast, uh, our, our guest, uh, um, uh, William Burchett, he uh, yeah, I always ask the question. It's like, well, what's the uh, what's the um, uh, greatest threat to SMBs? And the the, the stock answer is ransomware. So it, it, it but but he said and I think that this is straight on. He said it's getting bad advice. And it, that, was, that was a great answer because it's spot on. And that answers what you're talking about as well, too, because these businesses, again, they're not, they probably don't have a risk management program, period, no. let alone an InfoSec risk management. And so they're not really thinking along those lines. So you're, you, you have a virtual CISO service that can speak to that um, second line of defense and, and, and translate the risks so that it's understood. And here's where a little bit more of a soapbox thing again is like you got to be very careful about um, the type of virtual CISO that you're engaging because, uh, again, it's exploded and there's a lot of people now practicing it. And some of them are not skilled in second line, but they're very skilled in first line. And if you're hiring a, a virtual CISO or some sort of an advisor and you expect it to be second line risk management to help you navigate through all that noise and understand what is really something that I need to concentrate on, they're not going to be able to tell you beyond like, well, you got to put all these controls in place, these technical controls. So, um, so, so, I mean, and all joking aside, I do think that some sort of an outside advisor, just like, I mean, if, if, if you're a small business and, you need help with accounting or you need yep. help with uh, legal. I mean, you don't have a, a, a CPA on staff, so you go outsource. You don't have uh, HR on staff. That's why they have these, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the acronym, but it's basically, um, you know, uh, ma HR management as a service. It, it's the same thing. That, you know, uh, I mark it up to like going to see a specialist. If, if you have some, God forbid, you have a medical problem. You know, you're not going to go see a internal medicine doc for a neurologist issue. You're just not going to. You need this is a specialization. And, exactly. Yeah, it, and, it really it really is. And you need that. And and you're consulting with multiples of them and, and they to get the right advice. You know, getting bad mm -hmm. advice is a huge issue. And you're you're exactly spot on with uh with your rendition there of some of the things that are going on in the market. 
And and that's really where the liability comes in in this field as well too. It's like there's there's very little things that a virtual CISO I think can be liable for, but certainly if you're not giving like industry um in industry standard advice, meaning that, you know, you get a, you get like 10 virtual CISOs in a room, they look at what you said, and it's just like, well, no, that's wrong. Well, then you've done something wrong. And, and, and that's what I'm really afraid of, because, because if you try to practice anything outside of your space, you are going to be liable. And no, I mean, I always, I always encourage virtual CISOs to carry a, a E&O and, and cyber liability. Um, but, they're not going to cover that as well, too, if you're not giving them the right advice. It's a dangerous, it could set a dangerous situation for, for both the business and for the practitioner. And you know what, that actually, there might be an idea there to just like in medicine, there are standards of care. Maybe there are some standards and they do exist. I mean, we have a, a lot of, whether you look at NIST or you look at what CISA is saying, or, you know, you're using the MITRE attack framework, as the case may be, stick to a, a guidance that is consistent with what the industry is saying as a whole. Well, in, in the absence of that, like the, the standardization, we, our firm, our, all of our all of our uh, clients, they're, they're led by a virtual CISO that has had at least five years of experience at the highest uh, infosec executive level, uh, full time, and also carries a current CISSP. So, in lieu of uh, not having that out there, that's that's how we try to to perfect put that forth. Excellent, excellent. Um, when you is there, how does an SMB know? how much money to spend on it? Is there some rules of thumb in terms of percentages on how much money should be allocated towards cybersecurity? It's whatever the consultant says. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, the big four actually make a very good living doing exactly that. You know, I, and, and, and I, I never really liked the idea of this, the standard of like saying, well, you know, uh, cybersecurity, information security should be 15% of the IT budget. It's, it's, it's all, it's, first of all, it's, it's all situation dependent. I mean, it depends upon um, what industry you're in, what regulatory bodies you're beholden to, what amount and type of data you're, you're using and, and, and what an attack could mean as far as your business goes. It, you can't have that one size fits all, but you can kind of massage it a little bit by fair, but I won't go down that path again. But then there's also the idea by by tying it into IT, what are you doing again? You're perpetuating the idea that information security is just a technology issue. And that and and I and I don't like that. So I try to remove that from the equation and say, let's stop comparing it to IT and make InfoSec its own budget. Make it its because it is. It's a risk, it's a business risk endeavor. So but if you want to give the easy answer, 15%. Oh, well, <laughs> so. so should, well, I, I was going to ask a harder question or a little bit more controversial one. Should this, by what you just said, should the CISO work for the CIO or should that function be completely broken out? That's a very good question. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I, I, the, the, the stock answer that I'll say is like, no. The, the CISO should not work for the CIO because you've got conflict of interest. But there's never such a thing as a stock answer in risk management. If you can manage the risk, it doesn't matter where the CISO sits, so long as a couple of things happen. There's not that conflict of interest, meaning the CIO is not overriding the CISO. Uh, the CISO has um, visibility and communication to the board of directors and the C-suite. Um, other than that, it's more of a functional thing, I think, when all is said and done. Now, in different industries, different fields, I think banking gets it right better than any other field. Because oh, typically really? in banking, you have a chief risk officer because banking's all about risk. You have those eight or nine different risks in, in banking, liquidity, reputational, capital, um, and operational is one of them. And usually InfoSec falls uh, in that. Um, it's been a while since I've been in banking so uh, directly, so I might have missed a couple. Um, 
but in lieu of a chief risk officer, who is really in an organization that really knows the most about risk? Is it the CIO? Eh, probably not. No. It's probably the CFO. So I always would like to see in a basic org organization, the CISO reporting either to the CFO or to the CEO. And of course, you know, the title CISO is kind of, uh, it's almost meaningless in a way because, and I'm paraphrasing from somebody that I, I cannot, I cannot identify, but it was from a, a seminar maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Unless you report to the CEO or the board of directors, you are a chief of nothing. <laughs> you know, that C <laughs> means nothing. Um, that's why I always say, you know, you, the highest level information security executive. But so long as you have visibility and communication again with the board and the C-suite, um, it becomes less of an issue. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and that's the that functional coverage where it becomes pro problematic is in the compensation, right? Because if you're if you're working True. for the CIO and they determine your livelihood, then you may report to the CEO or to the board or dotted line to them. Uh, but it has practical ramifications. And I think that results in there's conflicts there that we see. And I, at least I personally am a big proponent of get the CISO out of there because a yeah, lot of times yeah. they have to comment on the CIO's programs and say, look, you guys are, you guys are building this app, but this thing's full of flaws here. Yeah, you could set yourself up for like uh, kind of like career suicide in a yeah, way. Yeah, career so. suicide in a way, right? <laughs> you you really could. And 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 I think businesses that are serious about risk management have to be very cognizant. And that gets back to the comment of bad advice. If my livelihood's dependent on it, well, maybe I might dole out some bad advice, you know? I, I I'll believe in whatever you want me to believe in if it pays well. <laughs> why, why is why why is the average tenure of a CISO like eighteen or twenty months or whatever it is? That's pretty short. You, you it takes you like a good eight ten months just to learn the field and to learn the environment. That's there. a really so, good point. Really good. Well, point. it's a, and 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 it's a rhetorical question in this case. I don't have an answer for it. I I could I could opine, but but that would be an entire, an entire another. Episode. That could be an episode actually. <laughs> that could definitely be an episode, but so, I'd have to like get a bigger soapbox. Are there metrics? that you would suggest decision makers should become cognizant of relative to information security. So people who know nothing about InfoSec, but are going to get asked about budgets, instantiating a program. Is there some fundamental guidance on things that they should know this should be affected, what you're being sold, make sure you make sure that these three, four, five metrics are, are made effective? The, the correct answer to that is the CISO, first and foremost, has to understand the business, has to get in and, and, and realize awesome. what are the things that the business is really focusing on. And there really is no stock answer. Some people like to come in with like saying that we killed X number of threats or, um, you know, we, we backed up, we had recovery time of X, Y, Z, or we had response time of, you know, three hours or something like that. That's right. And these... These may or may not be good metrics, um, but how does it fit in into the business? Because um, my uh, um, one of my uh, uh, instructors in my capstone class at uh, for, for my master's degree, he was very fond of a saying which I have adopted, and I have to pay him a dollar every time I say this. Um, that that you've given me the what, but I want to know the so what. So if you're going to give metrics and you're just giving the what and you don't understand the so what, in other words, what does this really mean to me as a business executive? You've got 10 minutes in front of the board, if you're lucky, with questions right. and coffee. It's right. like you better be spot on with what, what the business really needs. And that gets back to what I just said beforehand. It takes the CISO several months just to understand that, really understand that. So I didn't try to like, um, you know ease out of that question by not being able to give an answer, but that's the best answer I can give. No, <clears throat> you know, the, having context to the business, cybersecurity exists to enable the business. Yes. And, and, and the business is going to go forward regardless. I, you know, this is why we have shadow IT, because sometimes cybersecurity programs get so intrusive that people are like, well, I still got to do my job, so... Exactly, exactly. And that's what it's all about. And so many times people, you know, the, the, the InfoSec becomes the department of no. And I, uh, stop it. Just <laughs> stop. You know? 
Yeah, that's that's yes. It no, becomes the no, of the no. Department they, of they no, become the yes. policemen, <laughs> and that's not the role. And they no. they really need to become collaborator collaborators in the business. Yeah, and the, it, the 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 CISO and the CIO should be should be uh, you know best friends forever. Um, basically, they should have a really good working relationship, regardless of reporting structure. Well, I I won't comment on that because it get me in a lot of trouble. But that's it. So uh, speaking of trouble, let's let's talk uh, about in the last couple of minutes we have here real quick on the on the Russians and the Chinese. Should uh, small businesses be they care about what those guys they're reading about it in the papers, right? The Russians are into our infrastructure or the Chinese may be doing A, B and C as the case may be. As a small business, do you care? So what? Oh, oh gosh, I, I, absolutely. I, I one of the things that I that I try to um, emphasize to folks is is to to watch the news. I have the news on almost all the time on a TV right to my right. I, I turned it off for the podcast because otherwise, if there's like a major story, I'd be doing this all the time. And you'd be looking over um, <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> but 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 you need to understand the geopolitical situation because that is such a driver of threats out there, and uh, even more so beyond the basic stuff. Yes. Okay. Uh, China wants to attack us because China wants to be world number one and Russia wants to attack us because they're really upset about how we're supporting Ukraine. And there's so many other reasons in this and that, but, but you need to understand like how it goes a little bit deeper. Like for example, um, a big reason why the Russians and the Chinese are perhaps maybe shaking in their boots, so to speak, it has to deal n not anything with anything geopolitical, but has to deal with, for ex one example, um, uh, the, the SpaceX's Starlink. Uh, because now you're providing this ubiquitous, cheap, fast, easy to put in communication that, you know, <laughs> um, Yelensky, do I have his name right? I sometimes yeah. trip over it. Uh, the president of Ukraine uh, him or one of his government folks uh, 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 said something along the lines of like, you know, Musk, get a Starlink in here, just sort of out of frustration. Right. And Musk tweeted like within an hour, we're working on it. And within three days, they had all these terminals there. Nothing geopolitical there. That was just a, a, a response to something. But then that becomes a worrisome. So what's going to happen? The Russians and the Chinese, they're going to up their game. And um, and then also the more that private businesses do those sorts of things and they become targets. I'm not saying that Starlink's a target, but Starlink's probably a target, um, you know. So I do think that it's important through through what you and I do as well, too, to provide this sort of information in a way where it's uh, the threat environment, the 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 why these things are happening again, the so what to the what. Um, what does it mean to your business? Because you might see an uptake in uh, in 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 um, business email compromise emails or, or ransomware phishing, those sorts of things. And this is why spending the money to have a good security program in place makes sense, makes business sense. It isn't because you know it's a cool thing to do, even though it is. Um, but but it, it it gets into that informing the C-suite and the board of directors about the risk environment out there. And the more that they have that sort of information, whether it be from a third party advisor, somebody in house, or as they learn as well, and it should be a combination of all of those, um, the better they can make those decisions. And, you know, I'll throw in a little bit uh, onto that top of that commentary is that businesses uh, also, when you, if you have operations overseas, it's, or if you have suppliers overseas, one thing become cognizant of is your collateral damage clause in your cyber insurance policy. Because if one oh, of your that's a very good point, yes, if one of your suppliers gets breached and um, an insurance company considers that as an act of war and it's collateral damage, then they're not going to pay out. So that's right. That's right. And 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 and, and sometimes. Uh, Folks, they don't read their policy. They the, don't. Do, the little, that's part the of the little risk. font, you know. You know the the six point font that that is an eye test for 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 people of our experience. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's why I got glasses, man. I'm telling you. Uh, but look out for the that kind. Of, that's part. That should be a part of your risk assessment. If you're doing a comprehensive one, you're going to bring that into the picture. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I got to We're down to the minute mark here. I wanted to give you a chance to plug anything, talk about anything. You you are already an author. You got any new books? Any new things coming out that you want to talk about? Put well, out? I think 
I think in, in addition to the virtual CISO podcast, uh, and again, I don't really want to plug my podcast on your podcast. <laughs> but, it's okay. Um, but but um, I am going to be speaking at the uh, CU Intersect conference in, in Houston in about two weeks. Uh, okay, excellent. Two weeks from yesterday. This is a credit union um, information security conference on the value of a virtual CISO, and we hope to record that. And we'll have that up and available um, probably sometime in August. And then in September, we're going to be doing some episode recordings on site for the first time of, of the podcast at a really cool conference in North, Western North Carolina called Retreat. It's at Montreat University, and it's a small conference. They're, they're really building up their, their cybersecurity program for the future uh, generation of cybersecurity professionals. They partner with the Carolina Cyber Center. Okay. And it's, it's an absolutely wonderful conference. I'm very pleased to be Awesome. Uh, participating there and um, just ask folks to check into it certainly will and greg thank you so much for uh coming on the show it was great talking to you great advice it was my pleasure it was a lot of fun it Enjoyed was it. a lot of fun i hope to have you back sometime again uh, anytime anytime <laughs> all right hey take care greg thanks for joining us